they come in, they immediately take over and arrest all of Tactical's guys. Frank is currently trying to figure out how to get them out. These guys have tens of millions of dollars in in hostage insurance. And these insurance companies, they don't want to pay $10 million for some CEO that gets kidnapped somewhere in Africa. And he's being told that this is a CIA plot and they've got credentials that say secret service. Like, it it don't look good. It doesn't look good. Hey, this is Matt Cox, and we're going to be talking about the Frank Amadeo story, It's Insanity, which is based on the book that I wrote, It's Insanity. And at this point, Frank's got a good chunk of money set aside. I mean, I think he's probably close to $180 million of money that he has kind of set aside for money that was supposed to have been sent to the IRS for payroll withholding taxes. So he's got $180 million. And according to Frank, now I've heard other people say different things, but according to Frank, his company was approached, which is basically tactical, the military company that Frank um, had founded. Tactical was approached by Dr. Oscar Kashala's uh, campaign director, I think. I think it was campaign director. Uh, so they approached Tactical, and part of the uh, part of why they were approached were was that that the director wanted Tactical to provide private security for for um, Dr. Kashala. Now, Dr. Kashala was a Congole- was a Congolese born citizen, right? So he was born in in the Congo, which is the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It's what I'm talking about. It's a country in Africa, if you don't know. The 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 DRC or Congo, whatever, the DRC, Democratic Republic of the Congo, they were hold they were about a year away from holding their elections. And the current president who was I forget his name. I'll, I'll mention it. Uh, I'll look it up in a second. He was president. He had been president for several terms. He had taken over the presidency from his father, which I'm pretty sure he murdered. Like that's that's Congolese politics. We're really African politics. Like he, this guy had like killed his father and taken over something along those lines. And then they he had it had be, the Congo had become a democracy and he kept winning the elections so this was the first time that the congo was about to happen this was in 2006 the congo was about to have a real democratic election nato had come in and was kind of helping conduct these elections and dr kashala who had been born in the congo but had moved to the United States and was a Harvard educated doctor. So this is a this is a you know this is a western educated person who has the right to run for president in the Congo. So like this is the guy that the US wants to become president of the Congo. Maybe. Anyway, and sometimes they just want a, a dictator, a guy that's just brutal, that will back up anything the U.S. wants. What happens is campaign director comes to tactical. Frank, they come to Frank. This is Frank's kind of version. I've heard that actually Frank had also kind of re- maybe possibly could have reached out to Dr. Kashala. But since I wasn't able to co- talk to Dr. Kashala, I don't know. Regardless, they came in, they sat down, they had a meeting. And Frank said, listen. We'll not only provide security, we'll back your campaign and we will run your campaign for you. All I'm asking you to do is base the new economy in the Congo off of capital genesis. Now, Frank had a plan where he was going to go in and he was going to 
so there, there's the Bank of, I, I want to say it's the Bank of Africa. There's like the Bank of Africa, which is in many of the countries in Africa, which is actually owned by, I believe, the Belgians. Uh, and it's actually owned by like a family in the Bel- in Belgium. And, and honestly, it, it's completely unstable. So what Frank was going to do, his plan, and how far he got with his plan, I don't know. He had some meetings. I'm not sure. But his plan was to come in and try and take over the Bank of Africa. The way he wanted to do that was, it was, uh, there was multiple layers to it. But, well, let me explain first. What is Frank's interest in the Congo? Like, why would you want to go into what is essentially a poor country in Africa? Okay, here's the problem. The pro- thing about the Congo is that it's actually a poor country, but not because they don't have natural resources. It's actually got the highest concentration of natural uh, resources in, in, in the world, actually, of cobalt, uranium, titanium, magnesium, gold, silver. You get the picture. And they've got, it's like $4 trillion worth of, of these minerals that are located in the Congo. The problem is that the political situation, because of multiple tribes fighting the Congolese government and these constant upheavals or, or, or rebellions that they have, no country wants to come in and dump a ton of money into the area to build the infrastructure to go in and get, get to these minerals. It's just too unstable. Well, what Frank figured out was this. And here's the problem in in Africa in general. You you only have really two classes. You have the ultra-rich and the ultra-poor. That's a problem. So what Frank figured out was, listen, here's what I could, here's what we can do. We could go into the Congo. And and here's why they don't have a middle class. They don't have a middle class because it's it's difficult to have ownership of land, right? Like to build houses and own a house and keep that house and get a mortgage because there's a large Muslim population in the Middle East and in in Africa in general. And so the Bank of Africa, even if they wanted to lend mortgages, they can't securitize land and pay interest under Shiite law. So what Frank figured out, figured out a way where he could go in, build the houses, and have you live in the houses and make payments on the houses for with no interest, but by charging additional money for the labor, um, wood, uh, the land across the board you could basically in a very in a real way mortgage those houses without interest but with the payments built in now if the people did not do because of shiite law if people didn't make the payments you can't kick them out you know you can't foreclose and take their property but what you can do is you can recoup the property upon their death so What's the what's the worst that happens? You simply have to wait. You have a depre- an, an appreciating item, uh, appreciating uh, piece of security that you have to wait for someone to be de- deceased. But the the idea of the of that being an issue really wasn't a concern because of the amount of money you could charge. The other thing is by by build by going in and getting this four trillion dollars. And the amount of money that these people would be paid and the middle class that it would create because they could now have home ownership, the wealth it would create within that country, Frank and his analysts had determined would create a very large middle class society within a decade or so. But it would require a ton of an capital investment. So. The first thing to do to get that investment from the Middle East, by the way, which is where he was going to get the, the, that money. He's going to get that money from the Middle East. The way he's going to, he thought about doing that was the first thing he has to do is get, is 
go in, ha- get Kashala, get Kashala elected. Secondly, he has to build a large private military that is loyal to Kashala. Right now, there are generals inside of uh, the Congo, and each general has its own army that's loyal to the general. So it's unlike the United States where if the president tells a general, I'm going to need you to move your forces here or there or there, they say, yes, sir. It's there. They serve the president at his be, you know, behest. Well, that's not exactly how it works in the Congo. It's a discussion. Really we need you to do this. And if the guy doesn't want to do it, he just doesn't do it. So it, it's a problem because you also have a police force that doesn't necessarily do what the president says. It's all done on political threats and political negotiations, and it, it's extremely corrupt. So if you get Kashala, who's an outsider, elected, and you build, bring in your own private military, then you could probably clean that country up enough to get investors to come in and invest to get this $4 trillion worth of, of natural resources, that a ton of which would go back into the country. Now, you, they're going to lose some of it, obviously, but it would at least stabilize it and create a middle class. You could have roads, you could have electric uh, electricity, you could have uh, um, clean water, you could have sewers, uh, septic, you, know, you could have all the things that they don't have right now in abundance. So Frank had this whole plan. First thing is get get Dr. Kashala elected. So he he gets uh, Kevin Billings. He gets Kevin Billings and Joe Robinson. Joe Robinson, by the way, um, ran has run several several mayor mayoral campaigns in Orlando. He also was, I believe he was the head of the SWAT department for the, uh, for the Orlando police department. And, and so he's got a lot of experience in running campaigns and in military. And that's, you really have to have to run a campaign in Africa. You gotta have some military experience and you have to have political experience. It's not, it ain't the U.S. So they go in there, they go in with Kashala, and the first thing that they do is they start putting up billboards everywhere. They enter him into the presidency, they put in billboards, and the first poll that comes out, out of, I want to say, 50 or 100 um, uh, people running initially, he ends up being, I think, 36. 33rd, 32nd, 34th, something like that. I forget what Frank. It was in the low 30s. So they start really pumping the IRS's funds into this campaign. Like, so, and TV ads, radio ads, billboards, people passing out flyers. Like, like they're putting money into this that African campaigns don't typically see. And very, very quickly, Kashala starts dropping. He goes from 30, 33, to 25, to 20, to 15, to 10. I mean, the, the, the polls are, he's really gaining. Um, it, it, it's, it's interesting because when Billings and Robinson go in there, they set up several different camps. So they've got like a, I, I want to say it was the, like a, they have like the, um, the DRC, it was like, like the DRC Hyatt or Hilton. And they have, they take like the first couple floors of that building and they put, they've, they're running their campaign out of that. And they've got, a couple dozen security forces living there protecting um, Dr. Kashala. Because you have to understand there, there are these, there, the rallies are getting bigger and bigger. Out of the 50 to 100 camp, uh, candidates, 
there's they're, they're falling out left and right. Like they're dropping out left and right. They realize they don't have a prayer. And it's consolidated down to roughly 10 at this point after four to six months. And Kashala, by the time they have this one rally, I remember it was like, it was like 40,000 potential voters in like a soccer stadium. It's massive. I mean, just this massive rally. And uh, Kashala at that point in the polls was third. So he was third. The current president was number one. And the se- the guy in second position was actually a general. And that kind of lets you know what how how things are run. In the uh, the DRC, they, they'll blow each other up. They'll kill each other. They'll they'll put car bombs. Uh, political rivals get murdered all the time. So think about this, General. Let's take one of our former generals, General Schwarzkopf. General Schwarzkopf, while acting as a general, could have never run for president. But the the guy in the second position in in the Congo at that time in second place. He was a general. He had his own military. He had his own standing army. And he's he's running for presidency. And he's that's his current job as general. So you can imagine how how tense the situation is. Anyway, I I, I always remember uh Billings was at this uh this rally, and there's whatever it is, 30, 40,000 uh Congolese, and they're screaming and they're chanting, uh, they're chanting for for Kashala, I mean, they're just like, I like, it's just like, Kashala, Kashala, Kashala. And he's given this speech and it's just, it's, it's just insane. While that's happening, you've got their whole operation being run from the Hilton. They have a secondary location that Billings has set up with about 30 some odd guys in a, in like a compound that is four or five miles outside of the city, the city limits, which is, you know, loose to say the least. And he's got this, this group of, of guys there. So the president, which is in, in first place, his name was Joseph Kabbalah. Now, the general I was talking about was Jean-Pierre Bimba. I'm just going to go with General Bimba. General Bimba is upset because he can see the writing on the wall and he sees that Kashala has dr- jumped from like number 33 all the way down to number three. He's Harvard educated. He's extremely sharp and he's making him look very bad. His fear is, the general's fear is that this guy is going to win. So Bimba was concerned. Now, this is the way it played out was Bimba's concern was that he says that Billings and Robinson were putting together a military coup and that they were secretly planning on stealing the country's wealth. Okay. And and the reason for this is that Billings had gotten his hands on plans for Amadeo He'd gotten his hands on these mineral rights plans that had been done. So there was there's been extensive mineral rights surveys done. And Billings, through the according to Frank, through the correct channels, had actually gotten his hands on these on these plans, but apparently you're not supposed to have them. And that uh, foreigners shouldn't have them. They're for internal use. Regardless, Billings and and Robinson get their hands on them, and they're flying them back to the United States. Bimba had a someone inside the hotel that learned that they had these plans, these these surveys. So Billings and Robinson get on the plane, and I believe they got on the plane with the plans. And they're on the plane, planes, doors closing up, the plane starts to taxi they're about to leave they're very excited and all of a sudden the plane stops the, they they wheel the ramp back up they see military vehicles stopping outside billings thinks this ain't good uh, robinson's like something's not right and next thing you know they open the door some military officers come on with a clipboard and they call out both of their names you know 
You got Robinson, Billings. They walk up and they go outside. Someone wants to talk to you. So they, they both get up. They go downstairs. They go on the tarmac. They, they tell them, do we, we need your passport. They take their passports. They search them. And I believe this is the point. You keep in mind, they, you're talking about a dozen guys with, with AK-47 that are not, that are soldiers. And they ask for, they search Billings, and I believe they search him at that point, and they find his, either they found it on him or they found it in his suitcases. Regardless, they come up with his Secret Service credentials. So to them, Secret Service, that's CIA. Like they don't, they, these, they don't know the difference. So they're saying, Hey, you're CIA He's saying I'm not CIA. Like you've got these mili- you've got these these plans, you've got our 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 these secret mineral rights and your CIA and he's saying absolutely not. We we got these legitimately regardless. They take the passports, they bring them downtown, they hold them for a few hours and they say we're releasing you but we're not giving you your passports. So they can't leave. They go back to the compound. Everybody is aware of what's going on. They've contact. They've called back to Frank's team. Frank's team is currently making phone calls. They're trying to get them temporary passports so they can get on a plane and leave. They're very concerned. These are Bimba's soldiers. Bimba's soldiers just took your shit. So they're upset. I mean, they're concerned. They're trying to like, we got to get out of the country. They, they took, they took, they've got the, the, uh, the surveys. They've got everything. They don't know what kind of charges they're going to trump up trump up but they left them and so they're there with about 30 other guys right 30 of these um they're at the compound which is like i said four or five miles outside of the city uh they've got they have these um these guys that are are mercenaries these are are south african mercenaries and uh nigerian mercenaries that have that are making up their their contingent of security forces and keep in mind, they've got another couple dozen security guys at the hotel with Bim, with um, Kashala. So they're there. No big deal. They're there. They're trying to get emergency passports issued to them so they can get out of the country. And they go to bed. And at like, whatever it is, three or four o'clock in the morning after midnight, one of their private military guys, which are mercenaries, come to them and say, listen, there are soldiers jumping the fences. General Bimba's soldiers jump over the fences. They rush into the compound with armored personnel carriers and uh, troop transports. They come in. They rush in. AK-47 is drawn. They immediately take over and, and arrest all of Tactical's guys. Now, it's funny. Frank has always said that you know, these guys weren't armed. You know, Billings says they were armed. You know, Billing says these are nothing, they, they weren't soldiers so much as they were armed security guards. And they didn't put up a fight when you've got the soldiers rushing in. You've got, you know, you've got 100 soldiers rushing in. You've got 30 guys. Half of them are asleep. They're not going to, you know, they're not, they're not exactly going to put up a fight. So they all lay down. They, they yank Billings and Robinson out of bed. And they take all, they load, there's actually a, a kind of a skirmish that happens kind of in the courtyard. They start beating up one of the Afri- or they start beating one of the um, South Africans, I believe. And Billings steps in, they almost shoot Billings. It's, it's a tense situation. Like I write the whole, about the whole thing in, in the book. They end up putting them all on like the, in the transport truck and they move them to a, to an, uh, to an army base where Bimba is located. They lock them up in, in cells. And hours later, they start dragging them out one at a time. According to Billings and Robinson, they were very, very harsh on the Africans. Now, these are Nigerians that are armed and are in their country that they're being told are working with the CIA to you know, pull off a coup in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So these soldiers are, are 
Th- these guys are are upset. And you have to understand they're based on their limited understanding. Like they don't know any better. They're being told by by their general, this is a CIA plot to take over our country. These are armed armed people working for the CIA. They freak out. They're beating on these guys. They never really, now Billings and Robinson said they never really were that harsh on them. They did, they were aggressive. They slammed, you know, slapped the desk. They screamed, they got in their face. They did all that, but they never, they were like, they never really beat them. They said, but they definitely beat the other guys. And they're screaming the whole time. You work for the CIA. You work for this secret organization. It's a secret service. Like, can you imagine how that sounds? To to a to a guy in in the Democratic Republic of the Congo who's probably can't even read or can barely read, like, and he's being told that this is a CIA plot, and they've got a credentials that say Secret Service. Like, <laughs> it doesn't it don't look good. It doesn't look good. So anyway, they're interrogating him for an hour, two hours, three hours, throwing him back in the cell, interrogating him. I remember that they said they had basically they had like a bucket and they had a hole. So they could, t- as a, their toilet was in this little room where they got thirty guys piled in these rooms, and they're all they're all shitting in a little in a hole in the corner. Guys are you know after a couple days they're barely feeding them. They're giving them like old sardines, you know you you know scraps. They're puking. These guys are getting dysentery. They're shitting on themselves. They have diarrhea. It's just it's the conditions are horrendous. Frank's team back in Orlando, he sets up what he called the Situation Room. He sets up the Situation Room. They're calling uh, the Catholic Church. They're calling uh, the the UN. They're calling NATO. They're calling everybody. They're calling um, everybody to try and get these guys released. And they're also, while doing that, he's also having to explain that he simply was running a political campaign. That's all he was doing. Now, of course, you've got the Congolese saying, hey— and you have to think too, their 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 media is issuing articles talking about how this is a this was a military coup. So it also looks good for the general. I just thwarted a military coup. I just saved the republic. So it's just a bad situation all around. And I think that's a great place for us to leave it with Billings and Robinson in the uh, being held in a cell with there ended up being there's a total of 32 of these guys all being held uh, by Bimba and they're they're so it, they've been there for four or five days at this point and I, I think that's a great spl- uh, place Frank is currently trying to figure out how to get them out which in Frank's mind, he's one trying to negotiate. He's trying to get the State Department to help. But after a week or so, it's not looking good. And Frank actually reaches out to like a black ops, a private black ops company that is known for going in and rescuing hostages. Now, there are these companies, you know, you have this hostage type insurance. And a lot of times these guys have tens of millions of dollars in in hostage insurance and these insurance companies, they don't want to pay $10 million for some CEO that gets kidnapped somewhere, you know, in, you know, in Africa, what they'd rather do is pay half a million dollars and have a bunch of guys go in and try and rescue them. And if they get killed, they get killed. Then they don't have to pay the insurance. So, uh, they, he reaches out to these guys. And I mean, these guys have, these guys have helicopters. They've got the, 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 typically these places are run by former, Former special forces in South Africa. But listen, uh, we're going to get into all that in the next video. I really appreciate you guys watching. Oh, I would love to get into it right now. I'm just time crunched. Oh, it's good stuff. So I really appreciate it. Do me a favor. If you like the video, hit the subscribe button. Hit the link so you get notified of videos just like this. Leave me a comment. And think about, please consider buying the book. It's insanity. And... Also, joining my Patreon. I really appreciate you guys watching. See ya.